Mazel tov, it's a girl. Parenthood comes to N64 on N64 Works Episode 5. Enix's Wonder Project J2 offers us a glimpse into an alternate history for the Nintendo 64, a world where it followed closely in the footsteps of the NES and Super NES. Where Nintendo embraced both the publishers and play experiences its fans had enjoyed on its previous hardware generations. That's not precisely the world we ended up in though, and while there's plenty to be said in favor of the new concepts N64 helped establish, Wonder Project J2 makes you wistful for what could have been. As its title indicates, Wonder Project J2 is a sequel. Its predecessor, Wonder Project J, had been a Japan-exclusive release that doesn't appear to have set any sales records, but still evidently did well enough that publisher Enix commissioned a sequel as the company's N64 debut. Not only was this Enix's first N64 release, it was also its next to last. After publishing this and Mischief Makers in Japan, the company shifted its focus almost entirely to PlayStation, along with a handful of Saturn releases for good measure. Enix's departure represented a pretty significant blow to Nintendo. Obviously, Enix's defection to the PlayStation camp meant Nintendo was denied the benefits of Dragon Quest VII, which would go on to become the single best-selling PS1 release ever in Japan. But perhaps even more important than raw sales numbers was the impact that this had on the Nintendo legacy. Dragon Quest had been a Nintendo-exclusive franchise since 1988, when Enix dabbled briefly in the computer gaming side of its legacy by porting the first two Dragon Quest titles to MSX. Speaking strictly on the console front, however, Enix had practiced total exclusivity with Nintendo systems for a decade. Two weeks after Wonder Project J2's launch in Japan, though, Enix published a Super Famicom remake of Dragon Quest III, and then besides Mischief Makers, Enix would never publish another title on a Nintendo home console again, only for Nintendo handhelds. On the TV gaming side, the company went all in for PlayStation until its merger with Squaresoft more than five years later. Third parties moving away from Nintendo was hardly unusual during the 32-bit era, but what makes Enix such an interesting case is that the company didn't immediately cut ties at the time of the transition away from 16-bit systems. Unlike with Squaresoft or Capcom, Enix actually made the effort to explore the N64 market, which gives us a sense of what the company might have brought to the console's library had it stuck around longer. But perhaps Enix didn't stick around precisely because what it wanted to do was so wildly different from what N64 was geared toward. We see that at play in Wonder Project J2, a cartridge like nothing else on N64. It's a creation that seems more in line with what you'd expect to have seen on NEC's PCFX or Sega's Saturn or Dreamcast. This is an anime-style simulation game loaded with hand-drawn artwork and tons of dialogue. You simply didn't see any other content like this on N64, especially not in the US, where we didn't even see this game. Like its predecessor, Wonder Project J2 didn't reach America at all, as Enix had shuttered its US publishing arm and any Enix releases we did see here, such as Mischief Makers, were distributed here by other parties. The unsuitability of the N64 format to Enix's ambition, the N64's heavy focus on the US market, and, oh yes, Squaresoft's peer-to-peer -peer petition for Enix to move over to PlayStation all combined to make the company's flirtation with N64 a brief one. But the affair did produce this curious offspring, a game about raising a daughter. Well, sort of. A daughter who is also a robot. Wonder Project J2 plays like a sort of hybrid blend of Pac-Man 2 The New Adventures and Princess Maker 2. Your goal here is to raise a young, naive robot girl, teaching her about fitting into society while helping her come to terms with the vagaries of the human emotional experience. Loud, loud. It's a hands-off, god simulation kind of game where you have no direct control over the robot child, Josette. Instead, you interact with her through a cursor in the form of a bird, who is in fact called Bird, who provides you with a very limited set of options. You can say yes, no, or ignore Josette, and you can offer her items from your inventory. Pointing to a specific spot on the screen and pulling the N64's Z trigger will cause her to move to that point and examine anything she might find there. Your goal is to nudge her toward correct behavior through repetition and trial and error. It's a game with a leisurely pace, as your lack of direct control over Josette's actions means your ability to instruct her tends to be limited by her whims, moods, and ability to put two and two together. So, for example, if you want to teach Josette how to clean, you'll need to embark on a complex, multi-part process that involves buying a broom and making her feel bad about her body odor. The broom part is easy enough, since you simply buy one from the eShop in the submarine that Josette calls home, 
and toss it into the screen where she can interact with it. Josette will then attempt to use it in completely wrong ways, such as balancing it on her head or kicking it, and all you can do when this happens is hammer the no button. Once she finally tries rubbing the brush across the floor, pressing yes will help her realize that is the correct approach. Still, she won't entirely make the connection that the broom is for cleaning until you take her into the submarine hold and convince her to bathe in the shower stall. This is a much more complicated process, since her very first experience in the shower sees her step into cold water, whereupon she decides she never wants to do that again. Encouraging her to bathe will spoil her mood, which makes her reluctant to do anything until you bribe her with sweets. It's only after she interacts with people around the town where the sub is docked, activates the clothes washing machine, and realizes that she gets dirty and smelly without bathing that she finally agrees to shower again and makes the connection that, oh, the broom also works for cleaning. This sounds frustrating, and it can be, but Wonder Project J2 manages to try players' patience without becoming outright annoying. While there's a bit more brute force repetition than would be ideal, the process of teaching Josette is fascinating for a few reasons. For one thing, her unpredictability keeps you guessing. You can't simply hand Josette an object and have her immediately divine its purpose. On top of that, both her mood and her stamina levels affect her receptiveness. As a robot, Josette's battery fuels her brain, and when she runs low on power, she can't focus on complex tasks, especially learning from books. You need to allow her to rest and recharge when she's tired. And while she rarely gets into a truly foul mood, whether from being rebuked or by having a demoralizing encounter with villagers, it happens just often enough to keep things dynamic, forcing you to switch tactics. And this speaks to Wonder Project J2's greatest strength, Josette herself. The original Wonder Project J starred a young boy in similar circumstances to Josette. For the sequel, Enix and developer Givro appear to have taken notice of which way the wind was blowing within gaming and anime fandom and decided to give their predominantly male players a virtual daughter, or if you prefer, a virtual girlfriend. This vague embrace of what amounts to virtual incest was hardly some new idea. Gainax's aforementioned Princess Maker games saw you rearing a young lady who, under the right or wrong circumstances, would fall in love with the player. And honestly, many of Enix's earliest games were in fact skeevy computer titles featuring borderline pornography and child abuse, including one infamous work called Lolita Syndrome. That particular work involved playing games of chance with the lives of preteen girls, if you really want to be cynical, you could say Wonder Project J2 was Enix being true to its origins. But in fairness, Wonder Project J2 shipped for a Nintendo console back when that sort of content was strictly verboten on Nintendo platforms. The most egregious thing about the game's treatment of Josette is the fact that her billowing sundress shows off her underwear when she leaves with excitement, which is still not great and probably accounts at least in part for the fact that this game was never released in the US. But ultimately, it seems pretty mild compared to the teen exploitation featured in modern otaku games. Rather than taking a salacious approach to Josette's presentation, Wonder Project J2 instead paints her with a more innocent brush. She can express a variety of moods, from curious to bashful to sullen, and she flits between them unpredictably. Josette has been programmed to express an enormous amount of dialogue, and your interactions with her can start many different ways. Sometimes you need to initiate a conversation or lesson, while other times she'll start talking unbidden. Her conversational gambits sometimes lead to dead ends, since she wants to know more nuanced information than you can express with yes or no but other times she simply wants to drill you on your age, your gender, etc. Josette was drawn by Akihiko Yamashita, whose work has appeared in films as diverse as Legend of the Overfiend and Howl's Moving Castle. But fortunately, the tone here is in line with the latter rather than the former. But really, it is the writing that sells her as a character. Josette's more bashful or expressive moments border on coquettish without crossing over into pandering, leaving her enough of a blank slate that the player can project their own perception onto her. For teen boys and girls, she's an imaginary sister or girlfriend. For old people like me, she's more like an adopted niece who still needs to learn a thing or two about public modesty. It's also worth noting here that this video would not have been possible without a hacker by the alias of Ryu, who created an English language patch for Wonder Project J2 that's not only well written, but manages to convey Josette's personality brilliantly. While the game goes a long way in the simple quality of its 2D hand-drawn character animation, by far the best on the system, though admittedly the competition is pretty slim. Ryu's writing matches the visual presentation perfectly, helping to make your robot daughter into a compelling character in her own right as she learns about fitting into society. Really, the only downside to the 2D graphics here is how poorly the N64 hardware handles scaling. That fuzzy interpolation filter makes any attempt to scale up the cell animation look like a low-quality JPEG thumbnail scraped off Google images and blown up to high resolution. This is a failing of the hardware rather than the game, Still, yuck. 
Wonder Project J2 isn't all lush cell animation and the brutalization thereof, though. It also integrates some very early N64 3D sequences, which would be kind of awful if they factor more heavily into the adventure. Josek can take a variety of jobs to help earn cash for buying goods and recharging her energy, and several of these, notably fishing and mining, involve moving around through clunky 3D spaces. These are pretty perfunctory. They're simple and obligatory, what with this being a 1996 game. The only mode that really stumbles is the aerial combat mode, which requires Joseph to gun down dozens of automated drones right off the bat with no training in advance. If Joseph screws up in any of these sequences, or if she runs out of energy while exploring and learning, she wakes up three days later in the submarine with a 300 Corlo repair bill. As far as I can tell, there's no real significance to the passage of time, but money can be an issue. Every time you buy something and every time you restore Josette's energy, you burn through cash. You can sell back items to the sub shop to earn more money, but your main avenue to beefing up your savings is to send Josette out on those jobs. She can take on several different jobs, each of which has multiple prerequisites. You need to acquire a license to perform each job, and some licenses in turn cost money. You also need to open up the opportunity to even take the job by completing specific character interactions with villagers and making Josette has the appropriate skill set. At the low impact end of the scale, you can just pass out movie flyers. This nets you 200 Corlo for a few seconds of watching a brief animation. It's repetitive, but it's easy. Some jobs simply serve as single-time avenues to advance the story. You need to learn to be a waitress and work in the machine shop, both of which require both a license and a bit of training and specific skills and knowledge. However, you can only perform those roles once or twice to earn cash, after which the storyline advances in the restaurant and the machine shop, making those lucrative gigs no longer available. Other jobs are considerably more involved. Mining for proton energy and catching fish both involve the usual array of prerequisites, including boosting Josette's strength and balance. But the actual jobs themselves are very hands-on and send Josette into the aforementioned 3D sequences. Wonder Project J2 is, after all, a Nintendo 64 game and an early one at that, which means naturally its creators wanted to show off the amazing powers of this new console's polygons. For the most part, though, the game veers away from the 3D elements in action and focuses on Josette's interaction with the Islanders. In fact, the finale of the game is anything but the whizbing 3D action extravaganza you might expect. Instead, it's a half-hour sequence that plays out in a largely hands-off fashion. Josette pulls together all the skills and lessons she's learned thanks to the player and resolves the larger, looming, epic-scale story of empires and conflicts more or less on her own. It's a strange approach to a game climax in that it happens entirely out of the player's control, but it's not as though the precedent isn't established throughout the entirety of the game. Josette learns through interaction with the player, asking questions, responding to objects you fling into the play area, but most of her crucial progress happens without player input. A large portion of the game involves simply sending Josette into different scenarios and allowing her to work through that scene on her own. Every time you go into a place like the restaurant or the movie studio, Josette advances autonomously. She interacts with other characters based on what she's learned, how she's developed her skills, and her emotional development. Players can only interact with Josette when Bird is on screen, otherwise she's on her own. The scenarios Josette must navigate range from satisfying a master chef with her culinary skills to befriending a sickly blind girl to holding her own in a boxing match with members of the occupying Siliconian Empire. Josette will participate in a stage play, become a film actor, humble a circus strongman on a robot brawn, and maybe even find romance with a handsome local lad. This is what ultimately differentiates Wonder Project J2 from something like a LucasArts adventure. Where classic graphical adventure games require players to help the protagonist navigate social situations by making menu selections, here the entire point is to teach Josette how to become self-sufficient. Like a parent, you're there to teach her, encourage her, reprimand her, and steer her in the right direction. In the end though, the goal of Wonder Project J2 is to reach a point where Josette no longer needs your guidance. All in all, it's a charming and lovely experience, if occasionally frustrating. Because the game pushes so much of Josette's progress behind the curtain, it can be tough to know, for example, when she's strong enough to hold out in a fistfight, or skilled enough in the kitchen to create a masterful meal. You spend a lot of time directing Josette to perform the same tasks repeatedly until you reach some arbitrary point where her invisible statistics are suitable for the task at hand. It's a slow game constantly interrupted by Josette's questions and exclamations, but then this isn't really meant to be a speedrunner specialty. Wonder Project J2 was featured heavily in US magazines in the early N64 days, Yet it never reached these shores, and it's not hard to see why. Aside from the teenage panty flashing, feels like it would have been simply a poor fit for the US gaming audience of the era. Publishers and media alike were pushing edgy, in-your-face experiences at this point. Remember, Id's Quake shipped two days before the N64 made its Japanese debut, and that was far more representative of the American gaming vibe at the time than something like this.
A pastoral game loaded with whimsical animation and good-natured characters seemingly inspired by Gainax and Ghibli films, all the way down to lessons about the evils of imperialism and the sanctity of nature. It's largely a hands-off experience about teaching a young robot girl how to clean and experience the emotion that humans refer to as love. It just wouldn't have flown in 1996. Wonder Project J2 would probably fare better now as a Western release. These days, console gamers outside Japan have grown far more accepting of anime tropes, text-heavy simulations, and the idea that video games can be sweet and gentle-natured. It's really hard to imagine that we'll ever see any kind of Wonder Project J2 remaster, though. Since Enix's merger with Squaresoft, neither side of the company bothers much with bygone minor properties, no matter how worthwhile. Furthermore, developer Givro, formerly Omanic, of EVO fame, folded long ago, meaning any rights to and interest in reviving the Wonder Project series are scattered to the wind. But the good news is that we live in an age of flashcards, emulation, and fan translations. So track down Ryu's fan translation and experience the N64 launch window release that we were teased with but never given. If you feel guilty about emulating it, used copies of the cartridge sell pretty cheaply these days, and a complete unbox version would even come with an N64 memory pack. Since the cart lacked a battery backup, and Enix wanted to be sure players were equipped with the means to save Joseph's progress. Wonder Project J2 is not the greatest game ever, but it goes a long way on sheer charm. And more than that, it's a wholly unique experience on Nintendo 64. A peek into a reality where Nintendo and its third-party partners shored up their disagreements, and one where developers were given the freedom to explore the sprite-pushing capabilities of the console. Next time on N64 Works, Midway steers us back into the reality we actually got.